everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Gaithersburg Book Festival. I'm Lori Ann Sales, council member from the city of Gaithersburg and your host for this presentation. Before we get started, a quick plug to support the authors purchasing their books from our wonderful bookseller partners, Politics and Prose, one of America's premier independent bookstores. We have links to purchase in the presentation description. Given all we've been through over the past year, it's so important to support local jobs and the local economy. I also want to extend a big thank you to our 2021 featured sponsor, David and Michael Blair Family Foundation for their generous support. Okay, let's get started. Today we have with us four acclaimed poets to discuss poetry's role in social justice throughout history. With work spanning the pre-Civil War to the modern era, their latest books grapple with the long road of racism, patriarchy, and other social issues. Raising King by Joseph Ross, in the words of Joseph himself, urges readers to walk beside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from Montgomery to Memphis, past police dogs, mobs, and fire hoses, and listen to his thoughts, hopes, and fears. Joseph Ross is the author of four books of poetry, and his poems appear in many publications, including the New York Times Magazine and the Los Angeles Times. He has received multiple Pushcart Prize nominations and won the 2012 Pratt Library Little Patuxent Review Poetry Prize for his poem, If Mamie Till Was the Mother of God. By broad Potomac shore, great poems from the early days of our nation's capital by Kim Roberts, is an anthology of poems by both well-known and overlooked poets, working and living in the capital from the city's founding in 1800 to 1930. Included are poems by celebrated writers, such as Francis Scott Key, Walt Whitman, and Frederick Douglass, as well as the work of lesser known poets. Kim Roberts is the author of A Literary Guide to Washington, D.C walking in the footsteps of American writers from Francis Scott Key to Zora Neale Hurston and five books of poems, most recently, The Scientific Method, Political AF, A Rage Collection by Tara Campbell is a hybrid chat book of poetry and prose. The collection focuses on topics such as race, corruption, gun violence, police brutality, Confederate monuments, reproductive freedom, and the sexual harassment and abuse of women. Tara Campbell is a writer, teacher, Kimbilio Fellow, and fiction editor at Barrel House. She received her MFA from American University. She's the author of the novel Tree Volution and three other collections. Cirque's Bicycle, Midnight at the Organoporium, and Cabinet of Wrath, a doll collection. Moderating the discussion between these three powerful poets is E. Ethelbert Miller, an award-winning literary activist and author of two memoirs and several poetry collections. He hosts the WPFW Morning Radio Show on the Margin with E. Ethelbert Miller and hosts and produces the Scholars on UDC TV, which received a 2020 Telly Award. His latest book, If God Invented Baseball, was awarded the 2019 Literary Award for Poetry by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. As I turn it over to all of you, the only regret I have is that we're not celebrating your work in person here in Gaithersburg. We look forward to doing that next time. So for now, welcome Joseph, 
Kim, Tara, and Ethelbert. Joseph, Kim, Tara, it's very nice to be with you. Um, Kim, I want to begin with you. Um, we saw January 6th, uh, the attack on our capital. Uh, immediately, and many people made reference to the war 1812. Take us back to 1812 and talk about some of the writers that perhaps if we read today, some of the writers that are in your book, uh, might tell, provide a historical insight into what we just saw happen this year. Yeah, so um, my anthology um, uh, starts with uh, 1800 when DC was uh, founded. And um, a, a lot of the, those early poets, um, you know, I, I, was, I was surprised to see how many of them were making political statements, political commentary about um, government and the role of government in our lives. Um, and um, so I started even from those, those earliest poets looking specifically for writers who were bringing up issues that would resonate with us today. Writers who, who were writing about war and conflict, uh, about race, gender, uh, economic uh, inequities, cultural differences, um, uh, and um, you know, you, you, uh, you, you will not be surprised to know that uh, there, there were um, just a number of poets who uh, uh, were actively engaging with the, these political issues. Um, I would say that especially if you're, if you're looking at like 1812 and, and uh, some of those earlier eras, um, some of the most fascinating poems in the book to me were about um, uh, how the country was uh, uh, wrangling with race uh, and identity and specifically about slavery and abolition. And DC, um, you, you may or may not be aware, was the center for the internal slave trade uh, in the country. Um, and so it was also a major center for the abolitionist movement. Um, so um, I don't know, I, I think of, um, oh, uh, there's a, 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 a poet who was also um, uh, a, uh, a, a religious leader, a, a reverend by the name of John Sella Martin. Um, and, um, Oh, if you look at, I'm, I'm thinking of a specific poem of his from, from the anthology called The Sentinel of Freedom. Um, I, I won't read the whole thing, it's long, but um, it, you get some of a sense, uh, if I just read maybe one stanza, um, because it's just, it's so powerful. Um, the altars of bondage are blazing with fire. The slave in his chains is its grim sacrifice. The tones of the priest rise higher and higher, but his God now in conflict regards not his cries. The merchant in fear brings his gift to the altar. The statesman and jurist bring laws all in vain. The demigod's accents in doubt, doubt begins to falter, though union is sounded again and again, but all is in vain. The heavens grow thicker with portents of dread to oppression's weak soul. And almighty truth flashes brighter and quicker while terrific reason in thunders still roll. The earthquake is shattering their prisons to pieces amid the eruptions of volcanic speech while whirlwinds and torrents in fury increases, though tyrants alternately curse and beseech. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kim. You know, I, I want to begin with you, Kim, to provide us this historical sort of backdrop. But now I want to um, ask a question, um, have Tara begin it, uh, response first, and but it's for everyone. And, and that is, if you look back, um, and you all have books that appeared in 2020, and I feel that the country changed in 2020, the world changed in 2020. What influence did the Black Lives Matter movement have on your life and as your voice as a writer? And, and have you begun to view this country 
in a different way. So I'll be with you, Tara. Yeah, um, <clears throat> actually the, the Black Lives Matter movement introduced some, some cognitive dissonance for me in terms of how do I even discuss race? Uh, because as a mixed race person, um, you know, I, my skin has, is light enough to sort of walk through the world as my white part. Um, and I don't face all of the obstacles that, um, you know, my black cousins and my darker skinned siblings might face. Um, and so that made me think about how we even talk about these things um, is an obstacle because, you know, people like myself aren't necessarily part of that discussion in that we're both, we're both of these halves that are supposed to be warring. Um, and so I had problems with how do I even start a sentence in this certain context, because I myself am not the one at this particular kind of risk necessarily. So am I we or they in this circumstance? And it made me think about, you know, our language and, and how even the language is a barrier to coming together in this context. So it made me think really deeply about how we even begin to talk about these things. Mm. You know, before I have Joseph respond to it, Tara, why don't you read your poem, The Trouble with Pronouns? Okay. Yeah. I mean, this, this poem came about because of this very problem. Um, I mean, I would have conversations and I wouldn't even know how to start my sentence because I didn't know if I should be talking about, you know, we or they in this particular context. So I, I wrote my way out of it or through it or into it, if, <laughs> however you care to define that. Um, this is called The Trouble with Pronouns. But that's exactly why my lips and tongue freeze. Another unarmed black man dead and I wanna be clear, but my pronouns are a mess because I'm mixed race and mixed up trying to explain in black and white how we and they might bridge the gap. Why do my lips sometimes lack the confidence? These lips, speaking out of a light-skinned, blue-eyed face, lips of a girl who grew up in a mainstream, middle-class, two-parent home in Alaska, attended a multi-ethnic school, and hell, I'll spill it now, watched Gilligan's Island and Get Smart, wore hee-haw overalls, and played with Donnie and Marie dolls. So how am I even black enough? Because I have no history with collards or church, I don't feel like a caged bird singing. I actually have the bluest eye and my dreams are not deferred. They are affirmatively actionable. So have I actually earned the right to say we? But how could my tongue insist upon meeting my teeth? This code switching tongue rolling out the right sounds by choice by setting, by interlocutor, born in Alaska because that's the only place a black man could get a job in the 60s, trying to untangle scholarships from reverse racism in my classmates' comments. I did earn them, didn't I? That one drop coursing through my veins and a too uncomfortable thought for certain boyfriends' mothers, spending too many years with rollers in my hair and relaxer in my regimen, smiling at the swaggy black coolness my nephew informs me we share. And how can I not fear for my brother wearing darker skin than mine in a world where lawmen with guns don't hesitate to say they. My lips and tongue freeze and the debate rolls on all mixed up in black and white. Thank you, Tara. So Joseph, um, the question that I'd asked, you know, to Tara is also Kim, I'll get to Kim in a minute. Uh, how has the Black Lives Movement uh, influenced you? Well, it's influenced me a lot um, and it's influenced my writing and especially I would say it, it influenced um, many of the poems in Raising King. Um, one of the primary, one of the important ways it's influenced me is through, through my students. Uh, I'm a high school teacher here in Washington, DC. Um, and I watch these young people, uh, you know, walk through the world that uh, doesn't think they matter much and worry about the threats they face, read the fears they have in their essays and in their poems, um, 
and I try to understand that and to learn from them. Um, I am, you know, personally, I'm married to an African American man, and uh, so you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and its concerns live in my house, um, and I live with those concerns, all, you know, all the time. Uh, in terms of you know the the poems in Raising King, especially I I, I think recently, uh, as I've done more and more readings from it, it's only been out for about six months now. But I discover even some of the language of Black Lives Matter uh, in the poems, um, a couple of them that try to step into the the voice of Coretta Scott King or of Dr. King, and and, and I'm mindful of the the potential dangers in that. Um, but I. I uh, almost um, unconsciously some of the phrasing of Black Lives Matter language shows up there. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, what I, what I want really is that, at the, is that those two things converge, that the, the, the truth that Black Lives Matter um, shows up in these poems. Uh, Dr. King didn't use that phrase, he, you know, that the movement wasn't here then, obviously, in its, in its current formulation, but um, there'd be no daylight between his uh, view of the world and his uh, complex and thoughtful critique of America uh, and much of what Black Lives Matter, the movement is, is saying and is about today. Mm. You know, I want to link this to Kim. I want to ask you this question in this context. Uh, when we think of King uh, and we think of King in the dream, we really can think of like Langston Hughes in the dream. And then we look at Langston Hughes and Langston definitely being inspired by Walt Whitman. And so, um, Kim, I, I know that you're an expert on, on and love Walt Whitman's work. But in your introduction to your, your book, your new book, you talk about how Whitman's reputation has waxed and waned. And I was wondering whether, you know, now when we come to the Black Lives Matter movement, we come to what happened January 6th, should we look at Whitman to restore our belief in America or do, should we look at it differently? Oh, that's a fascinating question. I mean, uh, part of the reason why his reputation waxed and waned is because he is someone who we have traditionally invested so much uh, of our own interpretation in. So, um, you know, Certainly his record uh, in supporting uh, uh, people of color is really horribly mixed, um, yet he is um, uh, an icon for LGBTQ plus people. He is, you know, that, how, how much we uh, uh, read sort of him as the, the whole mixed pic picture, as opposed to picking out different parts, um, you know, changes depending on where we are at politically as well. So, uh, you know, I think you have to understand a lot of these poets in terms of the context of their times. Um, I tried where I could to give as much context as possible um, and I think you also have to recognize that we are uh, imperfect human beings uh, and um, try and take what we can uh, learn from these poetic forebears uh, and set aside those things that um, are what not useful uh, at that, that period. So I think Whitman is a, is a great example of that. Um, and of course, I did use um, one of Whitman's poems as the, the title poem for the, the right. end. My broad Potomac Shore comes directly from him. Um, but I, I, I really, I guess part of the way I want to respond to, to this is a non-Whitman answer, which is that um, when you put together an anthology, you're doing so very consciously to argue with the canon. And um, yes, of course, I'm thrilled to have Whitman in the book. And I couldn't think of having a, an anthology of DC poets without Whitman. But the reason why I wanted to put the, the book together was actually to increase the number of women writers, writers of color, working class writers, uh, writers whose work is just as good 
as Whitman or Langston Hughes or you know some of the, the uh, uh, bigger names that we recognize who are not for various reasons being remembered and read and taught in schools. Mm. Tara, um, you've just heard Kim response to my question. I'm going to quote you and have you explain your words <laughs> to uh <-oh>. Kim, <laughs> where you wrote, um, shut up about the American dream. It's not for you. This dream isn't a wish your heart makes, but something you build on stolen land with your father's money and the shreds of a tattered soul. You, you wrote that. Here we are with Joseph and myself and Kim. <laughs> How are we supposed to respond to what you wrote? Right. You know, that particular image was um, directed at a particular person who has been very prominent for the past, you know, approximately four years or so. Um, but it's indicative of this promise that, you know, the American promise that has been packaged um, to appeal to, you know, the 1%. And this is the myth that the rest of us are supposed to strive toward and aspire to. And, um, you know, as Kim said, as we, as we know better, we can take a better look at the role models of the past and sort of see them as complete human beings um, with all of their flaws and all of their strengths. And uh, the idea is to come to a deeper understanding um, you know, that quote is about sort of removing the scales from your eyes, um, but that doesn't mean everything is eliminated. That means we can see it for what it is and make our way in a more informed manner. Um, so yes, it's all, you know, part of this discussion about removal of monuments and street names changing and so on and so forth. Um, there has been a surprising amount of resistance, uh, surprising for me. Um, you know, because once you see what that person has stood for, um, and I'm talking about cases that even um, exceed the sort of, there's a standard as, in terms of like what someone um, would have reasonably been expected to believe at the time, uh, to Kim's point about taking the historical uh, time into context. Um, but there are people who exceed those limits, right, in terms of inhumanity. Um, and even in those cases, um, there is resistance to changing um, names and monuments and things for various reasons. So, you know, that, that statement is all about um, saying to folks, look, you've been sold an impossible dream. So let's recalculate, let's recalibrate, and let's hold people to account. Mm -hmm. Joseph, um, this is April 2021. Uh, 53 years ago, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. Uh, what lessons can we learn from King? Goodness, a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, my mind immediately goes to, I think, some of the some of his thinking that uh, that the dream language, the March on Washington speech, in particular, maybe you know his most uh, commonly known language uh, really sort of ignores um, and the kind of you know, what people sort of refer to as the whitewashing of King. Think about his um, critique of American culture in what he called the giant triplets of militarism, uh, poverty, and racism. Most Americans have no idea of the complicated, thoughtful, nuanced critique of American culture and, and really in some ways the international order that he makes through those three doors of uh, militarism, consumerism, or poverty, and, um, and racism. There is a ton there to think about and to read and to learn from, and um, I think provide, that provides us a, a, a lens through which to see our own country and to see the world uh, in some ways, in, in some of the ways that Tara was just describing, a, a little more honestly and a little more accurately. So then we can make uh, better cultural decisions about whose statue we put on a pedestal in the in a circle, or who we name a building after. Um, I've always been struck by this, and I, and I don't know if Dr. King ever wrote this or said this sort of you know explicitly, but you know why we think we can't critique our country and love it at the same time is just maddening to me. It it seems to me that. Um, Dr. King had it exactly right that, in fact, loving your country requires a kind of critique and insistence um, 
to make things better. And that, you know, the, the flip of that is, you know, some kind of America love it or leave it thing, which is, which is just, is just foolish. It's just anti-intellectual. It's just not thoughtful. And, mm -hmm. and, and we have to do better than that. Share with us one of your poems from your, from your book, Raising King. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, and one of the poems you had, you had suggested maybe I read is a, a short little poem called It Takes Time. In, in Raising King, um, there are three sections that go through th that where poems respond to three to excerpts from three of his books. Um, and this poem responds to a, a, something he wrote in Why We Can't Wait, which is about the violence of 1963. It's his, his second book. Dr. King wrote, we made it clear that we would not send anyone out to demonstrate who had not convinced himself and us that he could accept and endure violence without retaliating. And so this poem is called, It Takes Time. It takes time to learn this. It must be proven in the light of day that you will look him in the hand and love his fist to death. So at the heart of Dr. King's teaching and the heart of his Christian faith uh, is this deep, deep belief in nonviolence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I hope, I think that comes through in the, in the bulk of the poems in Raising King, not that everything is about nonviolence. He was about more than that, but that was his method. I mean, he deeply believed that that was um, gonna be the most effective method uh, for change uh, for oppressed people. Well, let's talk about teaching and, and Kim, um, Tara and, and Joseph, you're all, you're all teachers at one time. And I, I wanna ask you, Kim, in terms of, and also Joseph and Tara, in teaching, um, are there certain writers that you return to? And then also, Kim, in keeping with, with your most recent book, are there certain writers, you know, the lesser known writers that, you know, I want to teach and I'm going to introduce these names because they are very important. So why don't you respond to that, Kim? Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, there are certain writers who I return to again and again, but increasingly they, they seem to be some of these, these writers who are less well known. So for example, um, uh, I, I've been teaching um, uh, Alice Dunbar Nelson, who always gets overshadowed by her much more famous first husband, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Um, and uh, her work is, I, I think, you know, especially her poems, her, her prose, which she was better known for in her lifetime, um, has, has dated somewhat, somewhat, but her poetry just continues to gather in force to me. Um, I, I think of a lot of the um, writers who got their start during the, what we now call the Harlem Renaissance period. Um, and a lot of the, the writers um, who are best known to us now tend to be the male writers who moved to New York. And so many of the really top female writers of the movements uh, were here in DC. So I think of people like Georgia Douglas Johnson, whose work I adore. Um, so I, I just, I, I feel like we need to widen the, the discussion more. Um, uh, if there's time, uh, I would love to read actually a, a, a poem by Esther Popel Shaw. Well, if it's not a long poem, go ahead. Oh, shall I do it now? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Esther Popel Shaw um, was one of the, the, the Harlem Renaissance era writers. She uh, published under her maiden name. So uh, she published under Esther Popel. And um, this poem is called Flag Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag. They dragged him naked through the muddy streets, a feeble-minded black boy and the charge supposed assault upon an aged woman of the United States of America. One mile they dragged him like a sack of meal, a rope around his neck, a bloody ear left dangling by the patriotic hand of Nordic youth, a boy of 17. And to the Republic for which it stands, and then they hanged his body to a tree 
below the window of the county judge whose pleadings for that battered human flesh were stifled by the brutish, raucous howls of men and boys and women with their babes brought out to see the bloody spectacle of murder in the style of 33. 3,000 strong they were, one nation, indivisible. To make the tale complete, they built a fire. What matters that the stuff they burned was flesh and bone and hair and reeking gasoline. With liberty and justice, they cut the rope in bits and passed them out for souvenirs among the men and boys. The teeth, no doubt, on golden chains will hang about the favored necks of sweethearts, wives and daughters, mothers, sisters, babies too, for all. Thank you, Kim. And I love the way that the, the Pledge of Allegiance is repurposed there, Good. which, you know, a lot of contemporary writers are now looking back at some of these fundamental texts and doing that same sort of uh, writing. I just felt so contemporary to me. Thank, thank you for sharing it. So are there any writers that you return to? I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, mm -hmm. This uh, question for me is kind of a, takes us on a tangent because my primary uh, form is fiction and uh, speculative fiction in particular, as well as flash fiction. But I can speak to speculative fiction in terms of broadening our aperture of what, you know, what the, uh, what the goal is, um, you know, speculative fiction also had kind of this history that was much more limited than the people who were actually writing it. Um, it was very white, it was very male, it was very tech focused. Um, so like Kim was talking about in terms of certain figures overshadowing other folks who were actually doing the work as well. Um, I always like to uh, let people know that W.E.B. Du Bois was writing speculative fiction as well. Um, and that can be the face of sci-fi as well. So um, the writers that I come back to are kind of making this case by not making it explicitly necessarily, just, but they're making the case by existing. Um, one writer whose work I love to feature is Rian Amilcar Scott. Um, he is sort of playing at the edges of literary and fantastical fiction unapologetically, um, unabashedly blackly, you know, and he has created a whole town um, to play in, in terms of his fiction. So I always find myself coming back to his stories again and again. Mm -hmm. What about you, Joseph? Well, for the last several years, I've been teaching American literature and given a lot of freedom. So um, kind of built the course around Frederick Douglass, who in some ways, you know, I've discovered in the last 20 years, which is absurd, of course, but, um, you know, I grew up, no teacher or professor ever said the name Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman in a classroom or Langston Hughes until I was an undergraduate. Um, so, you know, I, we do a lot of Frederick Douglass um, uh, reading his, the narrative, um, reading several of his speeches, I was happy to see that in Kim's book, one of his poems is there because he's certainly not known for, for poems. Um, uh, I love to in introduce students to a, a poet named George Moses Horton. Uh, his, his poetry is, is amazing. It's very uh, 19th century, you know, four line stanzas, um, but it's also very clear and crisp about his experience as an enslaved person. His biography is the most distinctive thing um, in American Lit, I think, that students will experience. He uh, used to drive a vegetable wagon from the plantation to the newly founded University of North Carolina Chapel Hill on Sundays to sell the master's vegetables. Eventually, he uh, began writing poems for, for students' girlfriends uh, stu for uh, UNC students to give their girlfriends as, as he would talk with them and they'd realize he was a poet, became friends with a faculty uh, professor's wife who helped him to get his first couple of books published. He eventually asks the master if he can live in Chapel Hill and work on his poems. And the slave owner um, agrees as long as he pays a certain amount of money a day, which he does. And so he lives um, until emancipation 
off the plantation, like off campus, sort of. It's just the most amazing story. Unfortunately, he's not freed until emancipation um, when he, I think, goes to Philadelphia and, and marries and has children. And, and we end up with, I think, three, of his, three books of his poems. Uh, so um, amazing. And then I always return to um, the poems of Lucille Clifton, uh, especially at the end of a chronological survey of American lit. Um, because you just said something, Joseph, that I, I have to retain. Uh, when you said off campus, off plantation, I need to remember that. <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> on a serious note, uh, and this is very important, you, we are talking right now, having this conversation, you know, about U.S. history, social injustice, Black Lives Matter movement. But while we're having this discussion, um, the major concern, um, I think, right now in our country is the attacks against Asian Americans. Uh, and I've seen some people say, okay, well, you know, we need to know more about Asian Americans, you know, South, you know, Koreans and Japanese. In your own work and as teacher and, and, and also in terms of doing research, uh, how much are you uh, highlighting the work of Asian American writers? Uh, I'll begin with you, Kim. I, I'll begin with you, Kim, but I'll tell you why I begin with you, Kim, because <laughs> When we go, when I go back, and, and this is why I have so much admiration for you, uh, when I was trying to create historically pro, uh, creative writing program programs at historically black colleges, uh, you were one of the first person, the first person that said that's a great idea. I always saw you working in communities, uh, and, and even like the work that you're sharing with us today, where doing the hard, like archaeological work and digging. Uh, and I just was wondering, you know. Um, would you become like a model for us doing this type of work for Asian American writers? What has been their contributions to American literature? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it points out uh, so much about the inequities of the publishing industry. Um, I do not include a single Asian American poet in my uh, anthology because in that period, those early eras that I'm looking at, um, publishing was really not open <laughs> to, to uh, Asian Americans in a way that um, would encourage people who are writing to try and share their work in a more public way. Um, so while I include a couple of um, uh, American Indian writers um, in, in, in my survey, there are no Asian Americans. However, that, doesn't go, that does not mean that Asian Americans were not actively writing um, they just were not uh, publishing in mainstream newspapers and journals and uh, single author books. And I think that um, knowing that, that, that sort of history and having that foundation behind you is just crucial work. So I, I think that you have an excellent point that we need to start looking at specific communities uh, and, and, and sort of doing that, that research, doing that, uh, building on that. Um, and um, uh, certainly in my own teaching, I uh, teach a lot of more contemporary Asian American writers whose work I love. Um, and, you know, I would uh, specifically, if, if people are looking at a, a place to start, I would suggest Kamiko Han and Marilyn Chin in particular. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, doing, doing that sort of digging also um, to, to get to, you know, we, we, we don't just appear as contemporary writers. We stand on the shoulders of those people who come before us. Did you want to comment, Tara or, or Joseph, on, on my last question? Yeah, um, I, I have to say my approach has been more... Um, holistic, like whole picture. And I have not yet focused specifically on um, Asian and Asian American authors. Um, but one thing I do like to do when I teach my science fiction classes is focus on text of <clears throat> writers of color and, and women. Um, and a good resource for that I have found, uh, I'll just mention two books, uh, New Sons is an anthology uh, edited by Nisi Shaw and uh, it focuses spe specifically on speculative fiction by writers of color. Um, and then there's also the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy series, um, and that's an annual series since 2015. Uh, and that was also started as um, an answer to certain 
groups of people trying to keep the field very white and very male and voting down authors of color and women in awards, uh, in the Hugo Awards. So this uh, anthology uh, series uh, really sort of has an eye to, uh, you know, making or to elevating the work of women and people of color. And so those are two sources that I draw upon and specifically go through and sort of make sure, you know, like uh, try, to, try to be representative in my classes in terms of what work I put in front of students. Thank you, Joseph. Well, I underline your the, the concern, and I and it's um, it it for me as a as a high school teacher, it ties into some of what Kim was saying about who shows up, who who gets published where, and and what anthologies will include, you know, what writers. Um, I mean, in the American Lit classes that I teach, we certainly have we have taught Kamiko Han and um, Maxine Hong Kingston, uh, especially. But that's not enough. Um, and now there's a, a, a novelist whose name is falling out of my head, a Japanese American novelist who wrote um, uh, Convenience Store Woman, actually a Japanese novelist, not Japanese American. Uh, and I don't remember her name, but the, the book is amazing. So um, I have been limited, I'd say in some ways with who shows up in the, in the anthologies and it's, it's recent, I mean, even, you know, a, 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 a body of anthologies as big as something like Norton um, to have choices of Asian American authors in the American lit anthology is very recent, like in the last 10 years. Um, so we have to do better. I have to do better at that. Well, you know, my, my last question um, to all, all of you would be something that's tied in with, with, with Langston's work. And that is, you know, we're talking about social issues, social justice. Um, if you could dream a world, what kind of world would you dream? I'll begin with you, Kim. What do you feel is essential in terms of if we're talking about, you know, um, moving to Mars, <laughs> what, should, what should we make sure we take with us and maybe get it right this time? Well, I, I, I guess I, I would go back to the importance of hearing just the widest range of voices um, that we need literature for, for two reasons. Uh, we need literature that exposes us to things that are outside of our own experience uh, and take us to, to, to new worlds. And we also need literature that reflects our experience. And if our literature only reflects the experience of a tiny segment of the American population, then we have failed. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, continuing to uh, open up the canon, continuing to educate ourselves is crucial. Um, I think my answer is uh, a little basic, but um, to be able to better direct our fear, uh, because fear, yes, is a powerful tool for survival. We should fear fire when it's coming for us, um, but we shouldn't fear folks for looking different or acting differently or, you know, um, any of the reasons we have been told that we should fear people. So if we could better direct our fear toward truly productive, uh, you know, things that we do need to look out for to survive, I think that would be a, a root cause. But um, could you perhaps uh, close us, you know, this session with something from King that you find very inspirational, something that would be something that we should take with us as a reminder or just something that would keep us warm during this winter in America, even though it's spring. <laughs> yes, uh, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, the first, uh, and it also, it, it, it plays on some of Langston Hughes' uh, constructions. So, the first poem in the second section uh, of Raising King is called 1963. Dr. King begins um, Why We Can't Wait, describing um, a boy sitting on his stoop in Harlem and a girl in a, uh, working in a field in, um, in Alabama. Uh, and he goes on to reflect from there about their hopelessness. This is 1963, one. A boy sits on his stoop the house leans hopeless as he is. The rats love him and his family. They know him. He has nowhere to go. He has nowhere to be. He dreams of nowhere. When he wakes after dreams of nowhere, he goes nowhere. His school forgets him. He forgets him. His parents work, but their exhaustion forgets him too. Is he a dream? 
Has his country deferred him? Can nowhere explode? Two, a girl sits on her stoop, the wood of her home older than her grandmother, but not as sturdy. The field where her parents work is thirsty as she is, but not as angry. She sits and remembers school, but learns now in a field because debts are loud. They shout more fury than books. Three, this is the year. Young people will sing fury in a melody that hurts, in a rhythm that burns. A flame so hot, fire hoses shove these singers against walls, but those hoses and their water, their judges, their county clerks, their governor and their country cannot extinguish anything. Well, Joseph, um, Tara and Kim, I wanna, I wanna thank you. Um, I guess I would close that by saying we go from why can't we wait to why are we still waiting? Uh, and I would hope that as we, you know, people pick up your work that you provide a path to the future which will be filled with light and joy. So thank you all for being here at this festival. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Joseph, Kim, Tara, and Ethel Bird. That was a really interesting conversation. And as we're having the uncomfortable conversations about dismantling systemic racism and devising plans to center racial equity here in the city of Gaithersburg, um, I just want to uh, go back to uh, something that Joseph said that really stood out. Um, you know, we're living in a very challenging time and you can still love your country and criticize it at the same time because you know there are better ways to not only govern but navigate um, in this just towards a more just society. So I really enjoyed this discussion. Uh, thank you all so much for being here with us. Thank you. I'd also like to thank all of our participants, attendees for joining us for this presentation. We have an amazing lineup of programs for both adults and children throughout the month of May. You don't wanna miss any of it. Please go to our website, uh, gaithersburgbookfestival.org and look over the schedule so you can plan your festival for the month. Before you go, uh, we also have a special message for you from the amazing author and bookstore owner, Ann Patchett. Enjoy, everyone. I'm Ann Patchett here at Parnassus Books with my dog, Sparky, and I want to tell you the importance of supporting your local independent bookstore, Politics and Prose. They are a remarkable partner with this book festival. Now, when a book festival is live, it's really easy. You just go to the table and you buy your book and then you go to the event. But when a book festival is virtual, it gets a little trickier because you're home and you might think, well, you know, I'll just buy the book on Amazon. So I'm here to tell you, don't buy the book on Amazon. For one thing, Jeff Bezos has enough money, right? He's trying to colonize the moon or something. He doesn't need anything that you've got. Politics and Prose, on the other hand, they're your local independent bookstore and you love them. And they bring you so many events. They work harder than any bookstore I know in their community. And if you want them to be there alive and healthy and well when all this is over, you actually need to support them. They are the people that are putting a tax base in your community, okay? So you have teachers and police officers and firefighters and when you pay a couple dollars more for a book, you're creating jobs in your community. So enjoy your book festival, support politics and prose. Remember, Ann Patchett and Sparky think it's the thing to do. Shop local. Thank you.